Hi, my name is Heidi Beyer. I am a certified veterinary technician and I am going to give some practical tips for orphaned kitten care. I have been taking care of orphan kittens for 20 years. They're very near and dear to my heart and I will be able to share with you tips that will help you in your kitten care endeavors. Just a brief outline, I will be going over examination of your kitten, housing, feeding, helping the kittens to eliminate, grooming, cleaning and disinfecting, socializing, and solving particular situations you may uh, come across. So the first thing I, I do is I start off with a good examination of the kitten. There's a reference in your resources that goes through the exam that outlines aging, and I also have a picture of sexing the kittens on the next slide. You'll want to look for important birth defects, such as cleft palates, umbilical hernias, um, check the anus, make sure it's patent, um, and count their little toes, make sure they have all their limbs, um, check the tail, make sure that's on and doesn't have any problems. Um, also, we assess the kitten's reflexes. I check three major reflexes when I first get them. I check their rooting reflex by making a fist and seeing if they root into my hand, looking for mama's nipple. I check their suckling reflex by putting my clean pinky finger in their mouth and make sure that they're able to suckle. And I check their writing reflex by putting them on their back in my hand and see if they try and write themselves. Um, even a kitten a day old will not want to be on its back in your hand if it's healthy. So these reflexes will diminish in a fading or sick kitten. I assess their attitude. A healthy kitten wriggles a little bit, cries just a little, it'll eat, it sleeps a lot, and it gains weight. An unhealthy kitten is inactive, cries a lot, does not eat much, feels limp, and just doesn't look right. Also tends to get separated from the group. All the kittens should hang out together in a group. Um, I check their hydration status by looking at their gums and how moist and slippery they are. Tenting their skin is not as reliable in neonates as adults. The gums should be pink. Dark red gums may indicate dehydration or septicemia. You can also look at their urine. Concentrated urine may mean dehydration. It should be dilute yellow. Kittens cannot um, concentrate their urine until they're two weeks old. So up to two weeks, it should be like water, hardly any color at all to it. <clears throat> we want to check the kitten's skin. Um, look for fleas or any infections. Kittens can get anemic from fleas. The fur should be shiny, free of debris. Skin infections or any type of sore should be addressed by a veterinarian, especially in the case of ringworm. So make sure you develop a good relationship with a veterinarian that can help you with your kittens. Taking a kitten's temperature is very important. Make sure you use lube and only insert the tip of the thermometer. The kitten will be wriggly, so move with the kitten so you don't hurt it. Um, I pick a thermometer that reads quickly, and I've listed the normal ranges for your reference of the temperatures. Here is a very important tip. Never feed a chilled kitten. A kitten under 96 degrees Fahrenheit is chilled and will need to be warmed up slowly before feeding. You'll want to warm them up 2 degrees per hour. It is very important to weigh the kitten. Do this twice a day for neonates and use weight as a guide for feeding and for monitoring growth and health. Be sure to keep a written record of their daily weight gain. There's a sample in the resources of what they should be gaining and a digital kitchen scale works well. Um, you're going to need a digital scale because that'll get small enough. Your tiny babies might only be 100 grams, 150 grams, and you can't get an accurate weight on um, the other type of scales. I've listed the normal weight ranges and growth rates for your reference. They should gain about a half an ounce a day or their birth weight each week and weigh about 21 ounces or one and a half pounds at six weeks. Here's a picture of the umbilical stump. It usually falls off around day three to four after birth. Check around the stump for hernias, infection. You will see redness, pain, and swelling if it's infected. If you see anything, it will be important to seek veterinary care as soon as possible. Here's a slide that will help you sex the kittens. Males have two dots, the penis and their anus, and they look like little dots. 
Females have a slit and a dot, and there is a shorter distance in the female. Um, the male's penis and anus are farther apart. The females are closer together. Internal parasites are common in kittens, so I treat all my kittens preventatively with Pyrantel or Strongid, starting as early as two weeks and repeating every two weeks for at least three doses. I run fecals on all kittens, especially those with diarrhea, and treat accordingly as needed. I use Panazeril for coccidia or for unresponsive or bloody diarrhea, and I use Panacure for giardia. Since my kittens are in foster care, where there's a limited number of cats and the population is fairly stable, I start vaccinations at six weeks, then revaccinate every three to four weeks. If the kittens were in a high-risk environment, it would be recommended they start their vaccinations as early as four weeks, with revaccinating every two weeks. If the kitten drank colostrum and the mom had antibodies to share, these temporary antibodies can provide protection to the kittens for around 8 to 12 weeks. Then the antibodies fade away. These are great to have, but they can interfere with vaccination. So never assume that a vaccinated kitten is fully protected. Always be thoughtful about disease control with baby kittens, vaccinated or not. Diarrhea is also very common, maybe from internal parasites or dietary issues from adjusting to the formula. So all of my foster kittens get once to twice daily probiotics, about 0.3 mLs of Benabac until they're three weeks old, then once a day until five weeks to help stabilize their intestinal flora and help prevent diarrhea. Make sure you keep good records. This is very important. It helps you keep track of the kitten's growth and health, and it helps you remember what you've done so you can share this with your veterinarian and the new adapters. Proper housing is critical for success. You will need to be thoughtful about temperature control and space needs. Listed are environmental temperatures for different stages. A humidity level of 55 to 65 degrees will help prevent dehydration and drying of the skin. Sources of heat can include water bottles, heating pads, snuggle discs, and snuggle kitties. A snuggle kitty is pictured here. It has heat and a heartbeat. Whatever source you use, you must have a layer of blanket or towel between the source and the kitten. Snuggle discs, snuggle kitties, and water bottles will cool, so you'll need to check them often as they will pull heat from the babies. When using the heating pad, place it half under and half out of your crate or cage. The kittens will need enough space so they can move to a cooler area of the environment if wanted, but you must keep the living space confined and small enough so the kittens cannot get lost in the cage or crate. Here's another helpful tip. Check the temperature of the environment with a thermometer or by placing the back of your hand on the bedding for at least two minutes. If it feels too hot for your hand, it will be too hot for the kitten. <clears throat> also, have extra supplies on hand for changing out, such as towels, uh, extra blankies, and paper towels. If possible, try not to mix litters, as this may result in spreading disease from one litter of kittens to the next. Not all infected kittens are showing clinical signs, but they may still be shedding and are able to spread their infection to others. Kittens cannot regulate their body temperature for the first two weeks of their life. External heat will need to be provided. I like to use a heating pad set on low. I put it under half the carrier. I make sure to double up on the blankets that are directly over the heating pad and to check the temperature. Neonates cannot necessarily move away from the heat at their age. You will want to provide soft blanketing or fleece free from holes or frayed edges and strings. Kittens can become entangled in holes and strings. Check regularly if bedding becomes wet or soiled and change out immediately. Wet kittens can become chilled, even if they're on a heating pad or in a warm crate. Also, a growing kitten living in dirty conditions may not value a clean environment when mature. The size of the crate or cage the kitten resides in will need to be adjusted quite often until they are six weeks of age. Up to two weeks of age, the kittens can be in a very small crate and can remain covered until their eyes open. For single kittens, you will want to provide a stuffed animal to snuggle next to. At about two to four weeks, the crate should be bigger and should be uncovered at least halfway to allow light in, as their eyes are opening and they are beginning to hear too. They can still have a warm, covered side. A litter box is not necessarily needed yet as they are still dependent on assistance for elimination. At about three to four weeks of age, they may start to eliminate on their own.
I get really excited when I start to see pee spots on the blankets in between feedings. That means feeding kittens without needing to stimulate them is right around the corner. At four to six weeks, four to five or so, the kittens can have an open cage with small wires to avoid scape with room to walk and stretch their legs. There will be some overlap with their age. The food, water bowl, and litter box need to be accessible. The size and location of litter box does matter. Keep the litter box as far away from the food and water as possible. And keep in mind kittens are messy and may climb the sides of the cage and tip stuff over, so be sure to clean up regularly. For the litter box, I use a very small shallow box to start with at about three to four weeks. This is a drawer organizer I got from an office supply store. You can start to stimulate kittens over the box and use their front feet to paw at litter after stimulating. Earth raking is an instinctive behavior in cats. Don't panic with kittens that are slower to use the box, they eventually get there. Pelleted newspaper litter or wheat corn litter should be used during weaning as the kittens will sample or eat the litter during the learning process. Avoid clay and clay clumping litter. I transition them to the clumping litter when they're about 16 weeks of age. As for feeding milk replacer, I use KMR brand formula. The powdered is convenient to mix as needed, there is less waste, and it is more economic. You can freeze opened unused powder for up to six months. The liquid requires no mixing, but it's more expensive, and in my experience, I see more digestive upset. And when you have tiny, tiny babies, you're going to waste it because you have to use the can up within a day, and sometimes you're not feeding that much to the tiny ones. Only use homemade milk replacer in an emergency situation. I've included a few recipes in your references. If you know you're going to be bottle feeding orphan kittens, just keep a can of the KMR handy in the freezer. Milk replacer is made from cow's milk. Kittens fed milk replacer don't seem to grow as quickly. This may be because milk replacer is lower in protein, calories, and fat than queen's milk, and it is hard to give them their recommended calories per day without overfeeding them. For the first few feedings, dilute the milk replacer 50-50 with water or a balanced electrolyte solution to help prevent diarrhea. They may not like the taste of it at first, but they will eventually take to it. For nipple selection, you're going to want to choose a nipple that's 5 eighths of an inch. You don't want longer than 5 eighths of an inch because it will go too far back into the throat and the kitten will choke and can aspirate milk. Cut tiny crosswise snips on the tip of the nipple so milk slowly drips out. You don't want to stream. I'll show a video of this in the next slide. Make sure to pre-sterilize the bottles, nipples, and storage containers in boiling or very hot soapy water ahead of time and wash thoroughly in between uses. As for preparing the milk, generally the instructions are to mix one scoop of powder with two scoops of water. I like to mix a stock bottle with enough for 24 hours and refrigerate. I mark the stock bottle for easy mixing. I mark the bottle with the amount of water needed and add half the amount in scoops of powder. Level 30 on the bottle would need 15 scoops of powder. This way you don't need to add 30 scoops of water to your powder. Here's our video of preparing the nipple. Make small sideways snips. We're going to make an X in the tip of it. One snip, rotate the nipple, make another snip. Just a tiny bit like an eighth of an inch into the nipple. And that's what it looks like when you squeeze on it. you got a nice little hole there. Here's a video of preparing the milk. I microwave water in a container for about a minute and a half, and then I float the milk in the warming container until it's warm, the right temperature. Then I take it out with a syringe to put it in the bottle, assemble the bottle, and feed the kitten. I don't like to microwave the formula by itself to warm it up because you can get hot spots, plus microwaving will break down the proteins in the formula that you don't want to do. So make sure my nipple's good, put it on the bottle, and we're ready to go. Preventing diarrhea starts with the first few feedings. The first feedings should go very slowly, volume-wise, over the first 24 hours. Changing from mom's milk to formula can upset the kitten's GI system.
I have diluted formula 50-50 with water to ease the transition and avoid dehydration. You can also dilute the milk replacer with a balanced electrolyte solution. I always give probiotics. A study done in 2006 by Sarsnecki Malden showed that the use of probiotics improves the immunity of growing kittens. It is critical to understand stomach capacity and avoid overfeeding. It is better to feed less and feed more frequently than to overfeed and have diarrhea, regurgitation, and aspiration. The average stomach capacity in neonates is 4 mLs per 100 gram of body weight. I have included a feeding chart in the resources and will show, show it to you in the next few slides. You'll want to take the recommended stomach volume for the kitten's weight, then divide it by the number of feedings. A one-week-old should be fed every three hours, even at night. The key is to not overfeed and to space the feedings out around the clock. Feeding smaller amounts frequently will decrease the risk of digestive problems. A study done by Lawler in 2008 determined that the daily energy requirements for kittens is between 20 to 26 kilocalories per 100 gram of kitten body weight. This study also determined that the comfortable stomach capacity for kittens is 4 mLs per 100 gram of body weight. Most commercial milk replacers in the U.S. are only 0.74 kilocalories per mL and deliver a little over 19 kilocalories per 100 grams of body weight. As you can see, based on the comfortable stomach capacity, the kitten will need frequent feedings to meet its daily caloric needs while not exceeding stomach capacity. This may be why bottle-fed kittens grow slower than queen-fed kittens. If the kitten is adjusting well to the feedings, you may be able to increase the volume per feeding to help reduce the frequency of the feedings, but be aware that it will also increase the kitten's risk of digestive upset. As the kitten starts to eat solid food, you can also reduce the frequency of the feedings. This chart is in your reference. Now I will discuss feeding neonates between birth and two weeks of age. If a kitten can stay with their mom, that's most ideal, especially to receive colostrum, only bottle-fed kittens if absolutely necessary. Remember, kittens this old cannot regulate their own body temperature. Warmth is very important for proper ingestion and digestion. Their stomach will get gut stasis and the food will sit and ferment inside a chilled kitten's stomach and cause bloating and discomfort as well as possible regurgitation, aspiration, and death. Make sure your kitten is warm enough before attempting to feed. Their body temperature should be 96 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit. If the kitten is not warm enough, warm them up slowly over several hours, about 2 degrees per hour, before trying to feed. If they get warmed up too quickly, they may go into organ failure. I don't routinely take temperatures on my kittens before feeding. Instead, I examine their alertness and response to the nipple and make sure they feel warm and that the environment where I took them out of was warm. If they are not responsive or seem dull, that is when I would pause to make sure they're warm enough and take their temperature. Carefully pre-measure the amount of milk before feeding to avoid feeding them as much as they think they want, which can cause regurgitation, aspiration, and diarrhea. Feeding off a nipple is very different from feeding off their mom. The flow of milk is different, and nipple feeding is easier, so they may consume more in a shorter period of feeding as compared to nursing from their mom. If you don't pre-measure, kittens may consume more than needed, which may result in digestive upset. In my opinion, it's better to feed smaller amounts more frequently than to overfeed and risk problems. As for frequency, for birth to one week old kitten, feeding every three hours is ideal, seven feedings per day. For one to two weeks, you may be able to increase feedings to every three to four hours, six to seven feedings per day. For unresponsive feeders, I have used a stomach tube for feeding, but that's beyond the scope of this presentation. I did include a chart that goes through common feeding problems and solutions in the references. It is important to remember to burp your kitten by gently rubbing up and down the kitten's back while holding it up against your chest. Now we're going to see a video of feeding the neonate. So the kitten is placed sternally. I gently open the mouth with my index finger, the side of the mouth, and place the bottle right over the tongue, making sure a few drops go in and the kitten gets the hang of it. And then it drinks.
For feeding pre-weaned babies, body temperature is not as much of an issue, but don't take it too lightly either. The amount should be calculated as before. Take the total daily volume and divide by the number of feedings. You can check the warmth of the milk by squeezing some drops of it on your wrist. The warmth of the milk makes the milk come out a little faster from the pressure that builds up in the bottle, so be aware of that. Make sure the kitten is sternal or upright and the neck slightly flexed and stretched out with the nipple at a slight angle, not straight up and down. Kittens are very wiggly, so hold them gently and move with them, watching that they don't knock the bottle away with their feet. Try to keep the milk flowing through the nipple so the kitten doesn't ingest air. Again, if the kitten is not hungry, don't force the feeding. After a few attempts of dripping the milk on the tongue, if the kitten doesn't latch on to the nipple, try again in a half hour to an hour. Be sure to keep a record of the amount the kitten actually drank. As for frequency, two to three week olds should be fed every four hours, three to four week olds feed every four to six hours, sometimes only five times a day. These guys really need burping too. They're a little easier to burp because they're more active and sometimes they'll burp even while you're just trying to move them around. Growth spurts and energy expenditure will increase their appetite as well. Sleeping through the night is the goal for the caregiver. By feeding them more frequently during the day to meet their caloric requirement, you may be able to get a few extra Z's with the older kittens. However, my experience is different. I had to give up my sleep to enable kittens to make it through my morning work schedule. Sometimes six and a half hours I have to work between starting work and my lunch break. But I was able to make up for that lag time in other feedings. And as long as they're getting fed on a schedule and getting the proper amount for the rest of the day, it doesn't seem to bother them too much. <clears throat> Here's a video of feeding pre-weaned kitten. Notice we're quite a bit bigger than that first one. Wiggly, testing the milk, making sure it's warm. Place the kitten sternally, place the bottle, the nipple right over the center of the tongue, and then hold it so that you're not getting air and they have a good milk flow into the nipple and move with the kitten. And be careful the front legs do not push the bottle away from the kitten. They do like to sometimes knead on your hand. That's what's good about bottle feeding. They can kind of knead your hand to make it a little more natural for them. And make sure they get it all. Here are some helpful tips for bottle feeding. Make sure the milk is warm. Place the nipple on the center of the tongue to get the kitten started. Assure that just a few little drops come from the nipple into the kitten's mouth to get them stimulated. Assure that the kitten is sternal with the neck slightly flexed and stretched out, not crimped. Angle the bottle to prevent air consumption. You want solid milk stream going. Make sure your nipple is only 5 eighths of an inch, no longer. And be patient. Sometimes it takes a few a few trials, I've had kittens that will um, go a couple feedings without eating because they just don't want the bottle. They want their mom, but mom's not there anymore. But usually by that third feeding, they're very hungry. They catch on and they never look back. You can start weaning kittens around the age of four weeks. Milk should still be provided during this time, especially since you will want to go slowly with the amount of solid food to allow for acclimation to the food and avoid digestive upset. Here are the bowls I like to use for water and for solid food. They're hamster bowls or guinea pig bowls. The kitten is less likely to make a huge mess by spilling the bowl. You can start out with a gruel of slightly watered down canned food. I don't like to make my gruel too watery because the kitten can sniff in the fluid and possibly aspirate. Plus it's a lot messier to clean up in my opinion on the kitten and in the environment. Here's a picture of a kitten eating. They'll knead on the sides of the bowl. And as, a, as you can see, it's not too messy if the bowl is small enough. If the kitten isn't sure what to do with the food, you can encourage it by putting a small amount on their tongue. I like to leave out tiny dry food to let them explore. I've used Royal Canin baby or crushed up kitten food myself. They are teething at this age and they may appreciate something to gnaw on. As soon as they adjust to the dietary change, you can provide solid food and you can also water down dry food and use that instead of canned if the canned is causing issues, digestive issues. 
Don't forget the probiotics to help prevent diarrhea during this dietary transition. Weaning is a stressful time on the GI system of tiny kittens. Don't be in a huge rush to wean your kitten onto solid food. Dealing with diarrhea is not worth the few extra hours of sleep you may or may not get. Here's a cute picture of some kittens eating. And don't forget to weigh them daily and record their weight in your records. Neonates need to be stimulated for urination and defecation. Stimulate elimination by using the warm water from the milk bath on a cotton square or small piece of paper towel and gently rub the anal genital area to elicit urination and defecation. Do not rub hard. I like to stimulate over a garbage pail. You can move the kitten over the litter box at three weeks so they start to make the connection. Neonatal kittens are reflex eliminators and cannot urinate or defecate on their own. So stimulate after each feeding for up to about three weeks of age. They should urinate every time and the urine should be clear with barely any color. Keep stimulating until there is no more urine coming out. They need the stimulation to completely empty their bladder. When they are ready to defecate, they will use abdominal effort and appear to strain. Be gentle and patient. This may take a moment or two of consistent stimulation even after they're done urinating and clean up the area when they're finished. Kittens may not defecate every time. They usually defecate every 24 to 36 hours. The stool of bottle-fed kittens should be light brown, yellowish, and toothpaste consistency. If the stools are liquid, green, yellow, then you may be going beyond the kitten's stomach capacity when feeding. Here is a video of stimulating elimination in a kitten. So we have our moistened soft cotton square and we're rubbing the anal genital area takes just a minute. Usually when they're urinating the kittens will be kind of still and then they'll get a little more squirmy when they're getting ready to be done and we're checking the area. Doesn't look like, oh we might have some stool. Nope. Okay, no stool this time. And for grooming, use a warm, slightly damp, soft cloth and groom the kitten daily, as the mother would, behind their ears, down their back, their bellies, etc. Get all of their parts. Don't soak and chill the kitten, though. Cleaning and disinfection. Cleaning and disinfecting is important for all ages. Make sure you clean and disinfect the bottles and nipples between uses. Make sure your kitten is staying clean as well as its environment. Wash your hands between handling. You can also wear disposable exam gloves and thoroughly clean and disinfect all appropriate items between litters to prevent the spread of infectious disease. Avoid the use of pine oils or phenols for cleaning and remember to wipe up cleaning agents because the residue and fumes can be toxic. Excel is a nice product that is active against panleukopenia and ringworm, which is two of the hardest organisms to kill. As for socializing, up to two weeks of age, kittens should be fed, stimulated, and kept warm. Avoid a lot of handling by others or handling in between feedings. Kittens need to just sleep, eat, and grow. 90% of their time is eating or sleeping at this stage. Overhandling causes chilling, stress, and increases their risk to infections. At three to five weeks, kittens should start to be handled carefully in clean situations by all types of people in small increments of time. You'll want to acclimate them to children, adults, men, women, and do not feel guilty about asking someone to wash their hands in between um, handling your kittens. At six to eight weeks, this should be a time to allow kittens to run and play in different environments with different types of toys, boxes, scratching posts, etc. Now I'll go over a few situations that you may encounter in bottle feeding. If your kitten is not nursing, check to make sure it's warm. If they are truly unresponsive, you can warm them up gradually and give them a little carol syrup on a cotton swab under their tongue or against their gums. If that doesn't help, you need to get help from a veterinarian. Some kittens are poor doers and unfortunately die despite all your efforts. It has been reported that 20 to 40 percent of kittens die within the first seven days of life. This is also known as fading kitten syndrome. Caring for kittens with upper respiratory infection involves symptomatic care, keeping them hydrated and keeping their eyes and nose clean. Use a warm damp cloth to gently wipe each eye individually and clean the nares often. Consult your veterinarian if you feel antibiotics and additional fluids are needed. 
If a kitten has dark yellow urine, it may not be drinking enough. You may want to double check that they are getting the right volume of milk to water in their formula. If a kitten has diarrhea, make sure your milk is prepared properly and that you have ruled out parasitic and infectious causes. This is especially important if the kitten is also vomiting. Having a strong relationship with a veterinarian is essential in these cases where we may need medication. Most kitten diarrhea is from dietary issues and with supportive care will resolve. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of options except for cow-based milk replacers. To address diarrhea, I use probiotics, I sometimes will dilute the KMR, and I will reduce the volume of the feeding while increasing the frequency so the kitten is getting their full volume for the day. Once in a while, the kitten will need sub-Q fluids. Running a fecal to test for parasites is helpful. I prophylactically treat for some of the most common parasites, but occasionally a kitten will have coccidia and or giardia. Feline panleukopenia can also cause diarrhea and is life-threatening to the kitten and any others in the environment. Any kitten that is both vomiting and has diarrhea should be highly suspected of having panleuk and should have veterinary care as soon as possible and be isolated from other cats and kittens. I rarely see kittens with constipation. They do sometimes have very firm stools. But if you're stimulating your kitten and it's trying to defecate and it hasn't defecated in 48 to 72 hours, you can use one drop of mineral oil per feeding. I would bottle feed the kitten and then give it a drop of mineral oil, regular plain mineral oil, from an eyedropper for each feeding. Usually it only takes two to three feedings and then they'll be able to have a normal stool. Unfortunately, kittens will sometimes suckle on one another, especially when the litter has been orphaned at about two weeks of age, because they're used to pacifying off of their mother. You can tell they are sucking on each other because you will see wetness around their tail and they'll have swollen genitals. It can happen in females as well as males, and the only solution I have found is to separate them for a period of time. You can usually return them together at about four weeks. Make sure you put a stuffed buddy to snuggle with as well as their individual heat source if they're separated out. During their time of separation, it will be important that they have supervised playtime. I usually do that after feeding for social development. Kittens with diarrhea may develop a sore rear end. It is important to keep this area clean so it doesn't get more irritated and painful. Do not hesitate to trim around a kitten's rear end to help with cleaning. This will mostly be for long-haired kittens. Warm water rinses help soothe the area and keep it clean. It may be a bit startling to the kitten, so make sure the water isn't too hot. Don't douse the kitten with water either. Just the rear end area and make sure to gently dab the kitten dry so it doesn't chill. You can also apply some A and D ointment or Vaseline to protect the area from diarrhea and soothe the skin. Do not use diaper rash creams. They contain zinc and we don't want them eating that. Here are my references. Um, you do have a copy of these references in the slide handout. So I've given you some practical tips on bottle feeding orphan kittens. Taking care of bottle baby kittens is one of the most rewarding endeavors you can undertake. Without your willingness to provide this life-saving care to these tiny kittens, they would never have the opportunity to go to a loving home. So I feel it is well worth the great effort it takes to know I am making a difference to these special creatures. I wish you all the best in making your difference in these little lives.